Brent, all the way here from the analyst desk, and we are ready for a rematch between last year's two best teams in Team Liquid and Cloud9. Super excited to get into this one. You can see already there on stage, Blabber with a starting spot. He had to be second fiddle to the MVP jungler, Sven Skaren, for all of last year, but he did get subbed in despite that. You know, sitting mm -hmm. behind one of the best players in all of the LCS, now he's got big shoes to fill. And people know his play style. He's a very active jungler. He's very aggressive. It does fit the new season 10 style where you pick a level three jungler, you go gank some lanes, Flowers. You PVP at level three. Let's see what these teams got lined up and ready for us here as we're into the first champion select of spring. Irelia and Orn banned out by Cloud9. Team Liquid gonna go ahead and some things never change, Kobe. Players still don't like dealing with Akali. <laughs> very, very true. Akali, until she gets a couple of nerfs coming her way, is probably gonna remain permanently banned in the LCS. Meanwhile, you can see on the side of Cloud9, they're targeting Impact, uh, one of, if not, uh, the most outstanding performer for Team Liquid, him and Doublelift, put in so much work last year, both in the LCS and at international events. Specifically internationally, some games it looked like it was impact against the world for Team Liquid. This guy was keeping them above water time after time, and you can depend on him when it all hits the there fan. But hey, Aphelios going to be played here in game one of LCS Spring Split. This is a champion of great debate and discussion among the League of Legends community because he's got quite a few guns, my friend. Yes, you could tell there was a mixed reaction in the crowd at the first big four of Velios. <laughs> what can't be debated is that Velios has a lot of power, especially early on in lane phase, uh, is able to abuse a lot of the you know range from the sniper gun. Uh, he is going to be going up against Senna, though, which even though designed as a support champion, is most often played, especially in professional play, in the AD carry role. So we expect that to be in the hands of Double Lift. Well, we'll see how that goes along. We've also got Jarvan locked in here for Team Liquid in the jungle. This is going to be our first look at Shurnfire here in the LCS. Those who have watched the play-in stage of international events in the past may remember him representing Oceania. He had played from that region before, but now we're going to see what he can do here for TL since Broxa is still not able to play. And a bit more background on Shurnfire. Yes, he did very well in the OPL. He's also been playing terrorizing top solo queue players here in North America for quite a long time since he's come over uh, under various account names. So they may have run into him. Right along though here, Tom Kench in the bottom lane. You do need to defend Aphelios because the one weakness that this champion has no, uh, you know, extra defenses or dashes. No in dash, no invis. To, yeah, yeah to, uh, to save him. So you usually see Aphelios paired with Tom Kench or with Braum, um, two of the very defensive supports that can take some of the initiation and get him out. Talking about defensive supports, we've got a little bit of a conflict in the lore on the side of Team Liquid here with mm. Thresh and Senna working together. Sort of almost in the same vein as Thresh and Lucian working together, but just the other side of the marriage here this time around. That does mean that it will be double if playing the Senna, of course. You know what they say, the enemy of my enemy is my friend, Flowers. And apparently Cloud9 is the enemy of both Thresh and Senna. <laughs> they find <laughs> themselves right. on the same team. Into the second round of the bands here, though. Zoe gonna be taken off the table. Both teams still with mid laners up. And both solo lanes uh, in the current meta have really been trending towards mobile champions that can really move around the map, either get picks or make plays with your jungler. Mm -hmm. uh, we're coming off of a Worlds where the team that won with Duenvi uh, really highlighted that play style, and everybody has really taken that to heart, plus the preseason changes go along with it. I mean, you're talking about Duenvi, be, but I'm ta I'm remembering Chion specifically from the finals, just running around making a mess out of G2, splattering them all over the rift with his Lee Sin play. We'll see if Blabber can do the same thing here in this first game with LeBlanc joining the ban list there with Zoe on the side of Team Liquid. One more ban to come out from Cloud9 next to the Echo here in the second phase. Five seconds left to choose it. Let's see what Reaper and everybody on the C9 squad wants to go with here. And Orianna is the choice. All right, one of the more safe mids being banned away for some of the team fight power. Orianna bringing those extra shields and zone control. They don't want to let Team Liquid play one of their uh, more natural styles, which is, you know, towards the mid game, fighting, team fighting, that is, around double lift. 
And remember though, one of the coolest things that I think we got to see last year, for so long in the LCS, it was always the top team being slow, just outlasting their opponents, scaling up. But last year, specifically in summer, Team Liquid really put the pedal to the metal and started playing some faster League of Legends, which is what I'm excited to see them do here today. Of course, fast League of Legends doesn't always line up with a pick like Azir. And these two teams matching up usually has been Cloud9 drafting for the quicker composition and playing more aggressively, trying to speed up the game. Uh, and Team Liquid playing a little bit more on your outlast side. And you're talking about Azir, that's definitely one of those champions for them. Uh, a little bit more scaling there, but the Vagar is a classic for Cloud9 and Niski specifically. And Aatrox will be the final pick here for C9. That'll be in the hands of Licorice. And we've already seen some pop-off performances from this champion in week one of the LEC. And with Licorice being one of those top laners everybody in North America likes to keep their eye on, I'm hoping to see him do the same. And he has had quite a few games where they've even won from a deficit because of a Aatrox flank from Licorice. We got a real big Aatrox fan. Yeah, we, got, we got some crowd, fans here in the audience. That's what I like to hear, though. Popping off really early here. Let's go. Mordekaiser is the answer from Team Liquid up there for Impact, looking to take them into the Shadow Realm. It's one of the best top lane champions at dealing with ganks uh, and at split pushing, actually, because if the jungler comes to gank you, especially in Season 10, you are just happy to eat him up. Mordekaiser ults the jungler. He can easily 1v1 the jungler <laughs> at all stages of the game now, since there's a lot less experience in the jungle. Plus, if he has the opportunity to take either one of the carries from Cloud9 into the Death Realm, Vagar and Aphelios, as you already mentioned, for Aphelios, same true for Vagar, no dashes, no escapes. When that big old mace comes down, it's bonking you in the head. And there's two strategies. Uh, I've seen both with Mordekaiser. My favorite is to actually Mordekaiser ult the Tom Kench so that the rest of your team then can kill all of the other players on that team. There's no, <laughs> there's no Tom Kench devour if he's in the Shadow Realm, and it means that no one can defend that Aphelios. Whether you go for the VIP or the dude's supposed <laughs> to protect him, either way, you're making sure your job gets done. We're loading onto the rift now. The crowd is going wild, and we are just moments away from the first bout of League of Legends here for Spring 2020. It has been a long drought for LCS fans, Captain Flowers. You can tell it has built up all to this moment. C9 versus Team Liquid. Here we go. They're already ready, man. The gates aren't going down on the summoning platform just yet, but the teams are chomping at the bit to get out onto the rift. C9 and TL, remember, these two teams going five games head-to-head -to, -head to determine who was going to be our summer split champion last year. Now, once again, having a match here at the beginning of spring. All 10 teams with their emblems flying high in the sky. As you, you see Jensen and Niski on your screen here right now. Two players who have carried many games in their own times, both on some hyper-scaling mid laners. Means the later this goes, the more we get to see them show off. All right. We also have a sideline interview with Avali, I believe. So we can check in and see what kind of extra information she has been able to gather on this draft. Thanks, guys. I'm here with Dodo. Dodo, a couple obstacles and bumps in the road for Liquid with visas and missing Broxa, but I want to ask about your decision to use Shurnfire today and why you're using him over Pobelter. So we did have um, Pobelter practice with us, you know, all of January, but, you know, Shurnfire did come around, you know, four days ago, and he stepped right into scrims, and he was pretty, playing really well, even though he, he was, like, jet lagged or whatnot, but he really impressed us, and we decided to use him, and we're pretty confident with using him. And you're the first team to take on this new Cloud9. So with all of these new changes to the roster, is this team a threat for Liquid in the spring split? Not at all. You heard it here, Dodo. Thank you and best of luck. Back to you guys. That's what you like to see from a four-time champion. Not at all. That's confidence right there. And putting the magnifying glass on Shurnfire right now, you can see on screen during that interview, he started red buff, so that's topside, looking to have an influence on this Senna Thresh lane. That's a lane with a lot of setup. There's a lot of crowd control, so he's gonna be on the bottom half of the map, but so is Blabber, doing a red side clear here on Lee Sin, knowing the tendencies of Team Liquid and wanting to play around here as well. I mean, when you look at the bottom lane of Team Liquid as well, remember, this is double lifting core, JJ. This is the bottom lane that in everybody's mind always just stood out as a tier above everyone else in last year's competition. 
These two are the kind of guys that can just run the lane from start to finish. And you can't blame a jungler for wanting to get involved from either side to either make sure that happens or do everything you can to prevent it in the case of Blab. And as you can see on the minimap, they have their early ward there uh, highlighted in the river, just in case there's one of those really early Lee Sin ganks, one of them that can come down with the red buff. Mm -hmm. So with that extra vision, they have the safety to push up and try and aggressively move Aphelios under the tower to try and deny him some CS. Meanwhile, top lane impact going to yoink in Licorice, who's doing the same thing, pushing him under tower, trying to make impact, lose some of this CS, and you can tell it's already working. 18 to 11 there. Turn fire coming in for the gank on to Niski here. Manages to get the flash out of the Cloud9 mid laner, and that means no more escape mechanisms left. The cage takes a moment to drop. Jarvan can engage much faster. Next time he comes back, it'll be an easy kill. And that was a very, very efficient gank as well. I'm always looking at time efficiency for junglers, uh, especially in Season 10 here. Did not take him very long to burn that summoner spell. Now you can see Blabber knows. All right, Vagar pushing up in this lane. If you're this far with no flash, that means you are exposed as a Vagar. So he just wanted to hover there and yep. give a safe area for Nisky to retreat if there was a return gank. Uh, you know, to make sure he doesn't get denied any of that CS with the wave getting too far up in a bad spot. Checking back into the bottom lane, everything seems pretty par for the course here. Nobody's necessarily getting shoved under turret just yet. Farm pretty even between the two. Top side, farm looks pretty even. There's a pretty big minion wave building up here as Cloud9 looks to make a move onto Impact, who flashes Ooh. away, but Mordekaiser, without the mobility to try to get further afterwards, will just barely hobble out of that one. That's going to be a very, very big opening. Licorice already was trying to build up a decent advantage for himself, but blowing the flash off of Mordekaiser with Licorice still having his means Aatrox is going to be able to determine this lane now. So both junglers selecting a solo lane and getting a summoner spell advantage for their team. Now you have to look at the return ganks and keeping track of those timers. But I think the fun thing there is which one of those things is going to have a greater impact on the game. I remember seeing a poll online of pro players expressing which lanes they thought were the most important and the least important in professional play. Mid and jungle took up about 80% of the most important vote. Those were the two roles everybody said, you gotta have it, you really need it. Top, I think, got one and a half percent. So top lane normally falls to the wayside in terms of priority for a lot of these teams. Definitely true. Uh, one big thing, though, is that not only is it a flash burn, but there is also still a teleport advantage for Licorice. And teleport is one of the small things that allows top laners to have a bigger influence on the map mm -hmm. if you're able to save it and get that advantage and keep it uh, then you constantly threaten the other areas, right? Here we see a roam already. Oh, he tried to wait for the cage to go down, but Jensen just ends up stepping into the stun zone late and has to blow his own flash to escape that one. All right, that's going to even up those mid lane summoners. Definitely nice move from Vulcan showcasing some jungle support synergy roaming along with him. That does, though, uh, as you can see on the mini map, mean that Aphelios had to back off for a little bit, cost you a couple of minions there, mm -hmm. especially against a lane like Thresh Senna. So much crowd control, if they catch you, they'll be able to chain snares. Yeah, if either the Flay or the Hook or Senna's Wraith stun hits you, you're gonna be in trouble one way or the other. You've got to respect the wombo combo potential as Shurnfire shows himself here in the top side. Licorice's ward will spot him out soon enough to allow Licorice to get back. World Ender up and running. But remember, it's also all about that Death Realm on the Mordekaiser as the Drake is going to be started up here by the side of Cloud9. Ocean Drake should easily go over to C9, having shown Shurnfire on the top half of the map. Remember, with Rise of the Elements, stacking up those elemental Drakes getting towards the Dragon Soul can be huge while at the same time, the individual Drake buffs are weaker. So it may not mean as much to be able to secure the early ocean for your team as it did in season nine. But man, if you can get that soul, it just makes the game so much more favorable. Yep, as the jungler that loses an early dragon, you just say, hey, that's a problem for later me. Yep, it's not really a problem Future right now. You can deal with that in a little while here. <laughs> 20 be, minutes from now, maybe. It'll be a problem when the souls start to stack up. Bottom side, Doublelift and Core JJ find themselves on the worst end of a couple of trades there. You can see Sven having a very slight edge in terms of farm. Does have that Infernum equipped. 
That's your flamethrower there for Aphelios. That's the one that you see all the Reddit clips of entire teams getting instantly deleted when he drops the Moonlight Vigil Enchanted with it. But mm. it'll be a while before any of those come online here. Is still pretty comfortably sitting in laning phase. Shrimpfire passing off that blue buff to Jensen there in the mid lane. Just make that a little bit easier for him to spam and farm up. All right, I want to see if uh, Blabber's going to be able to return to one of the solo lanes and make good on these flashes that have been blown. Uh, Impact's up here on the top side is coming back fairly soon for him, so has a quarter of the duration left on that. Uh, meanwhile, mid lane, Jensen also has no summoner spells, so both solo lanes, possible attack areas for Cloud9 uh, to try and get an early advantage. But Team Liquid solo laners are playing fairly defensively, keeping their mid waves on their half of the map uh, and keeping track of Flabber. And one thing that I think is worth pointing out, because a lot of times, Especially when the teams in the game are among the top teams in the league. You can see a game that has no kills for a while already have a pretty substantial gold lead for one side or the other. Team Liquid's up a couple hundred gold over Cloud9, but they're not exactly running away with the game just yet. There's a couple advantages for one side here, a couple advantages for the other side there, but I'm still looking for that first big fight to break out before we see who's going to get themselves ahead in this game early on, as Shelly is being taken, and that could give a nice advantage in the form of some turf. And Impact is teleporting back, so uh, recalls all the way to base. It looks like they're happy just giving it up. Cloud9 were the first ones to the Herald. They claim that objective as well. So while your gold is fairly even, the neutral objective's starting to stack up for them. And look at Vulcan. He's topside. This is a remnant of the clutch gaming way of thinking. If Rift Herald's alive, everybody go top and get Rift Herald. Just bringing that over to the side of Cloud9, shadowing that, making sure that Blabber is able to secure it. And now we'll see what they can get with it. And that's just Rift Herald number one, which can be used on plates and can be used for a quick cash in even though the gold you get from plates has been slightly lowered still. Super quick punch of money if you want to funnel somebody uh, some extra early game cash. Let's see what Blabber can get done on Jensen. Still no flash. Not a whole lot, looks like. Not a whole lot of much of anything. Just All right, to jungler number two one. then. Shurnfire, what can he get done? <laughs> All right, what's it going to be up here? Could see these guys get into a nice 3v2. The turret laid down by Zvin there, finds a nice bit of damage. Calibrum plus Crescendum means that there's so much damage coming out. Every single time you see Aphelios blast somebody from 1,500 range away, it's those two guns. Yeah, that is the Reddit combo. That is the YouTube highlight combo, Flowers, that you're talking about. Uh, those turrets must be respected. You're kind of conditioned in League for turrets and smaller... Climber uh, turrets. Exactly. Walk up, smack it, okay, whatever. Not that, not as big of a threat until you see the ultimate, you know, the big one comes out or something like that. But Aphelios, he's got some extra guns attached to his. The turret's a gun with another gun attached to it. We got guns on guns here for Aphelios in the top side. Meanwhile, bottom, Impact and Licorice exchanging a couple of blows there. But again, both these champions pretty tanky, so don't think anybody's going to be falling over here quite just yet. Looking at the items everybody's got equipped. You can see Warriors coming across with Skirmish and Sabres for both of those junglers. Mordekaiser going for the early Ninja Tabby just to make sure he's better off in the fight against Licorice. And of course, it's also going to help a lot with the Lee Sen and Aphelios burst he might encounter once these fights get a little bit bigger. Next Drake is going to be live here in about 45 seconds. I feel like we've also seen some very good dodging early on here. Uh, even before getting boots, uh, the Death Grasp from Mordekaiser, both Licorice and Flabber, done a very good job sidestepping pretty much everyone we've had on screen that Impact has thrown out. Hasn't really affected the farm too much here. And we'll see if Flabber can get into position, try and use this Rift Tail, but everybody coming down for Dragon number two flowers. All right, this has got to be where we see that first blood because honestly, I'm surprised we've made it 11 minutes into this game with Blabber and Shurnfire being the two junglers and no first blood having transpired before 10 minutes. You often see at the beginning of the season, teams be a little bit more cautious. Here we're gonna have double activation. It is Dragon spawning Rift Herald. Oh, but the fight's already gonna be starting off. The burst coming through, and that's first blood over to Team Liquid. Core JJ puts another one in the lantern, but the counterattack comes out. Devil is not quite able to save his support just yet, but a flash over the wall will keep Core safe. Shurnfire coming in with the counterattack. Vulcan's now gonna be isolated, alone, and beat down. More damage coming through from Impact. One more swing of the maze might be able to do it, but Nisky grabs the kill onto Jensen. It is a two for one in the favor of TL. And we're not done yet. They're going right back in. Ben tries to disengage. 
Nice cage coming out there from the Vagar once again, protecting the team, stopping Team Liquid from marching any further forward. Shurnfire waiting on the wing. Cataclysm is still up. It was not used in the fight. Blabber coming up now, gonna be knocked up into the air. There's your slam dunk! Shurnfire's back in and he's showing why. After four days of practice, they've got him on the rift. That is gonna be Team Liquid getting the objective afterwards. It's all about the control war that started off, Flowers. Yes, sir. Core One JJ. Day. Core JJ sitting on that control ward in the side brush at River. This is the beginning of it. You can see Shurnfire, Core JJ, Doublet all sitting in here. And C9 not respecting that. Licorice walks right into it. Everything lands, and that is Cloud9 being down one member at the beginning of the fight, allowing Team Liquid uh, to get out with their flashes here. Even though it's a good re-engage with the attempt from the Aphelios ultimate, landing that Graviton snare after uh, the AoE, even with the extra flashes blown, they're gonna go really aggressively here. Jensen gets burned down by Niski off of the ultimate, but it's at the cost of the extra kill going over. So in the end, two for one, plus the first blood bonus for Team Liquid, and they even up the Dragons. Yeah, they get the two for one, they get the extra freebie kill at the end as Blabber just does not respect Shurnfire still having the ultimate. Meanwhile, bottom side, Licorice is ready to take Impact down. One more stab will do it. Don't need a mace, he's got a blade instead, and Licorice gets the solo kill. All right, you might catch me out on a control ward mid lane with the stairs. <laughs> but he gets right back out there, Flowers. That's how you do it. When you get knocked down, <laughs> get right back up and go for a 1v1. That's what I like to see. Licorice was the subject of so much talk, not as much last year, but the previous year. Everybody was so hype on this kid, this new young rookie coming out just beating people up in the top lane. Last year, he didn't have as good of a year, but people still have really high expectations for him, and things like that are why. All right, so take a look at this invade from Team Liquid. Nice little E here from Vulcan. He's gonna try and secure that blue buff for his mid laner, and he does. He's gonna put a stop to that Team Liquid incursion. Team Liquid still only 500 gold ahead of Cloud9 here, but looking to make some moves. Jensen finds himself caught out, and Niski finds himself 300 gold richer. And I believe it was Licorice again that starts this one out, trying to redeem himself. Back-to-back -back plays started out, and Cloud9 now, with the extra champion advantage on the map, are going to be able to push back out. Niski forcing pressure onto this mid lane tier one. He's got plenty of minions. He's got his jungler right behind him. They only need a couple more auto attacks to be able to take this turret down. First turret bonus gold is still up and available for the taking. And Cloud9 says, yes, sir, I will happily cash in on that one, finding themselves now at a 700 gold lead. All right, plus on the top side, Sven needs a little bit of damage onto the turret before having to back off. No extra wards, as you can see on the map. So there's a lot of uncertainty here. Don't want to overextend. And one thing that I think is also worth noting, we were specifically talking in Champion Select about the immobility of the carries on the side of Cloud9. And for immobile champions, Infernal Rift is the best rift. The less walls there are, the less disadvantages you have against champions that can jump all over the place. It makes it easier to own the fights in those areas of the map. It makes the cage so much more effective. It makes it so Aphelios can do his, oh boy, I better run away, so much easier. It's just a good situation to have. Plus, the extra damage stacking up on champions like these feels good, man. Definitely does feel very good if you can start to collect those Infernals. It's gonna be a late fight if we have a fight over a soul, though. Having split dragons this early on means yes. it's gonna be much more difficult for either team to get the full three. And I definitely foresee both teams contesting since it's such a close game state right now uh, on the spawn of Inferno. What's gonna become incredibly important is the vision leading up to those dragons because we've seen multiple times already these flanks uh, and even just the straight up 1v1s from Aatrox coming in. So you mentioned the Infernal uh, Dragon and then the Infernal Rift. There's so many more pathways now open and down to that Rift uh, Dragon Pit that you're going to have a lot of areas you have to cover with vision. Some more brushes being burned away as well, which means if you are on the run, there's less places to hide. This could make for a very interesting fight here in about 45 seconds. 
Cloud9 will drop their second Rift Herald of the game, this time in top lane, looking to grab another tier one turret before that Drake spawns. And this is all about the timings on the map, right? 30 seconds left on the Infernal, you can get this tower, you can leave uh, the Rift Herald up there and then have time to transfer down. There's 20 seconds, actually, it's still taking away both Niski and Blabber still up here, even though Niski has his teleport, so he's sticking around to finish off the tower. I think that's a good call to split there. They can still try and get into position. Control wards down for Team Liquid once again, though. You have to watch out for these hooks off of all these control wards. Core JJ has spent his time setting up for these picks. Well, he doesn't quite find the accuracy he's looking for there on Desvin, but of course, the rest of the team wasn't immediately nearby to follow up anyway. Team Liquid will have priority over this bottom side river as neither side wants to give this one away. Let's see how it transpires here, my friend. Round two, fight! Mid lane objective is up. <laughs> Let's see if they can go for it. Spooky Ghosts are coming out. Ooh. Left. Not gonna get tagged there. Aphelios ultimate just whiffs, comes up a little bit short. Moonlight Vigil not gonna accomplish anything. Impact there off the side, looking for some sort of a flank opportunity on the members of Cloud9, but he won't get it. Senna not gonna grab the root there either. Vulcan on the front line could be a target, but Tom Kench not typically somebody you wanna go all the way in on. As you said earlier, it's entirely possible for Mordekaiser to just isolate him, make it so the rest of the team's able to take down the valuable targets. Nice stun coming out there from Niski, making sure he gets a little bit of chip damage onto Jensen, takes off about a third of his health bar. And I say, in the fight over picks, even though last time around it was Team Liquid that got the advantage, C9 should have the advantage because they've got a Tom Kench, which is a get out of free uh, card. Get out of free jail? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just get out, get out free. <laughs> if someone does get picked. Meanwhile, he gets going to Vulcan is inside the cage, though. A little bit of a root coming out there onto Shurnfire means he loses half HP. This Jarvan's gonna be extra careful. This is not a Cinderhulk Jarvan. He is not tanky. Phage plus Warrior means you blow up when you go in. Infernal Drake is started now by the side of Team Liquid. Double it putting the auto attacks into it. Shurnfire gonna be tanking this one now for the rest of the team. We could very well see a smite fight. Blabber wants to make sure he stays within range. Cloud9 now with control over the Drake area. Cage coming down. Vagar trying to zone the Team Liquid members away. Vulcan continuing to stay on the front line near Niski, making sure that mid laner is not able to be jumped on. And Cloud9 will just strong arm Team Liquid away with their zone control. The slow zoning here, the fight over these wards. There must have been five, six control wards killed repeatedly in this fight. As C9 with a blue buff, Vagar just spam Cage, move up. Spam Cage, move up. Then use the Twin Shadow Slow to just edge them out and not give them any sort of move speed to get back in towards the objective. The arduous push that they had <laughs> through the river finally results in back-to-back -back objectives for them. And Inferno number one will be theirs. Very cleanly played there by Cloud9. They thought, all right, there's no reason to fight over this. Clearly, we have the advantage in this neutral situation. Push the neutral all the way towards the Drake and walk away. They now command a two and a half thousand gold lead for it. You can see the Black Cleaver there on the Aatrox. Working on getting Death's Dance next makes it that much harder to blow him up before he's able to get any of that damage off. You can see the gold here on your screen right now. Almost a 1,000 gold advantage for Licorice there in the top lane, primarily because his farm is just so much better. Yeah, he's definitely been a big point of power for C9. Let's see about the top side, though, because Team Liquid, in response to C9 getting Infernal and pushing through mid for that secondary turret, are able to get almost all of the top side. Almost doesn't count, though, Flowers. No gold earned for <laughs> partial credit. One HP might as well be one million HP as long as that thing is still standing in terms of the money in your pocket. Let's see what Cloud9 is able to do now, though. It is Team Liquid with control over the top side river. Some Cloud9 control wards still in those brushes, though, means they're not super concerned. Again, with it only being 21 minutes into the game, you doubt your opponents will be able to zerg the Baron down very easily. Felios turret over the wall is not going to accomplish a whole lot. Blabber looking to make the kick happen. Shurnfire is now going to be stuck in the cage, and he is taken down. Mid-jungle synergy showing up. Cloud9 winning the war of kicks. Ever since the early stage where Team Liquid got one out of the control rush that Licorice walked right into, it has been C9 mainly playing with the Vagar AoE stun. But Blabber finds his moment, picks off his opponent, and starts up Baron. 
no smite available for Team Liquid, but they might just fight it. TL knows they can't just allow this to be taken. They gotta make something sort of happen here. Cage gonna be placed down. Double look fire on the ultimate of the wall. Baron's still gonna be taken very low. Fight breaking out. Baron taken down. Team Liquid on the retreat. Impact stands alone, but stand he will not for much longer. Ooh. Flashing over the wall to stay alive, but that is still a Baron taken cleave by Cloud9. This C9 squad has come back firing on all cylinders, taking the pick, immediately transitioning into Baron, burning it down, and look at this, how they're able to keep Team Liquid from going all into the Baron pit. Belios turret does go down for extra damage, trying to burn that down. Vagar, that cage just keeps the entire Team Liquid squad at range. The Avelios alt lands, Licorice plays the front line, and since Impact takes Licorice into the Death Realm, he can't even 1v1 him. The Aatrox extra mobility, uh, plus the CS lead that you're talking about, and the extra gold that he's gotten, mean that he is not an easy target to take out. So no losses, no casualties for C9 on their way to acquiring Baron. Niski is 100% my MVP for this game for Cloud9 so far. These cages have just been the story of every single fight or every single what could have been a fight because Team Liquid is just not allowed to play the game they want to play. It's because Team Liquid doesn't have the greatest means of, get, of getting past it or getting those very quick hard engages off. It has to be a Jarvan EQ or a Thresh or Senna slow moving Kill shot that hits maybe from Fog of War is probably your best chance, which we did see. Uh, but they just don't have the arsenal to actually deal with that or get past the CC. And Cloud9 are doing a very good job slowly moving it in. Baron now empowering two lanes as Licorice buffs up the mid lane, and they move straight ahead here on bottom as well. TL knows that the cage is down for a couple of seconds here, but remember the cooldown is incredibly low for how powerful the ability is. Whoa! And double lift is going right back into the lantern. Jensen's gonna be chased away now as Cloud9 find themselves in a turret dive. Flavor's grabbing the kill onto Shurnfire. Jensen explodes under Vince's pressure, and C9 takes a clean ace. Niski doesn't even die after flashing in and Zonia's inside the base. He got ulted there by Impact. This is gonna be Cloud9 running it through. Your first Bud Light Ace of Spring 2020 and Cloud9 will start this split off right. There you have it. Cloud9 with some big off-season changes. I feel pretty good about where my stock market might be flowers. <laughs> that was your challenge, right? That was the one you said you were worried about now. True. Well, True. wipe the sweat off your forehead, my friend. Your worries have dissipated. No deaths on Niski. No deaths 